Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by returning guest Nick Turan. Um, Nick, it's been far too long. I think you were on a couple of years ago. Um, you're, of course, the great mind behind what is nuclear. Um, it's been a huge on ramp for many people uh, in this community. Um, so it's great having you back, man. Yeah, thanks. So happy to be here. I've been really enjoying, you know, what you've done with the show, and it's it's just, yeah, great honor to be back. Thank you for having me. Yeah, and I understand we kind of narrowly missed each other uh, in in COP. It's, uh, it's too bad you couldn't make it out, but um, yeah, had, uh, a lot of FOMO. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it yeah. Fun. It, it certainly um, like I got thrust into some sort of uncomfortable situations just in terms of you know moderating panels that I felt radically underqualified to to be on or. Uh, but it really forced me to kind of level up and I realized, you know, just how grateful I am for the community of kind of technical advisors and, and sort of, you know, nuclear consultants I can, I can rely on. Um, so it was a really big growing experience for me. There are a couple of themes though, that sort of came up for me really broadly, um, in terms of, uh, the event and the gathering and the state of nuclear and sort of where things are, are headed right now. And, um, you know, I guess I've brought this up a few times, but uh, Ernie Moniz and uh, his organizations, the EFI, I forget what it stands for, but the NTI, the Nuclear Threat Initiative, Cleaner Task Force, um, they produced this document called the Nuclear Playbook. Um, and it's a sort of guide for embarking countries on how to go about what are the best practices to build a nuclear program. And beyond it sort of being, I mean, I think ENAC consulted on it, the Emirates consulted on it, but you know, I, again, I, I have like this sort of undertone of anti-Americanism, you know, courtesy of my father and you know, <laughs> I don't know. We're, we're United Empire yeah. loyalists. Like we, we, uh, my family, uh, we used to be American and then we, we, you know, took the wrong side and sided with like King George and anyway. So, so there's a old bitter resentment there. Anyway, it feels a little yeah, bit of yeah, anti-Americanism. I, I won't dwell on it too much, but it was, it was interesting. Um, and, and in any case, I mean, most of the discourse that I see uh, in the U.S. right now around nuclear these last, you know, 10 years, there's a little bit of talk about Vogel, but mostly that's sort of swept under the rug. Um, and a lot of talk about advanced nuclear, next generation nuclear um, and innovation. And certainly the U.S. is Canada as well, I guess, you know, in terms of the pressurized heavy water reactor. But the U.S. is sort of the um, home turf of the widely deployed conventional nuclear reactors that make up essentially almost the entire operating fleet around the world, the mighty PWR and BWR. Um, and so I can tell there's a lot of pride still in, in you know, we may not be deploying, but we have the best technology in the world. And certainly that's sort of the line I've heard from Jigger Shaw and others. Um, so given all that and the focus on, you know, advanced reactors, it was really interesting that this document written by a number of American um, nonprofits and think tanks was telling embarking nations to be super technologically conservative. Basically, Cole's notes were, you know, choose a design that's in operation with a proven track record. Sounds pretty, pretty uh, sensible, you know, almost by definition, that's going to be, you know, low enriched uranium, probably a PWR, probably a once fuel, once through fuel cycle, so we can avoid any of the messiness around any proliferation risks. So it's very conservative advice. And in, in my discussion with Ernie Moniz, um, I said, well, you know, why don't you follow your own advice kind of thing <laughs> in terms of, you know, established embarking nations. And, and in, in many ways, the U.S. is a re-embarking nation, despite its massive nuclear fleet it has, that's been struggling to deploy. Anyway, so all that made me come back to this question of innovation, because obviously, you know, we need more than just electricity. Uh, we need process heat. We need, you know, some we need to replace a variety of fossil fuel services. There's obviously use cases for, again, process heat and other things in nuclear. In the early days of nuclear, there was just it's it's I was just reminding myself of some dates like the first human induced fission with like Lise Meitner and Otto Hahn, like 1938, the Fermi pile, the first you know, controlled chain reaction 42. And then we like jump into having a nuclear powered submarine like 10 years later. And I think Nautilus is like 52. And we have a commercial nuclear plant in 56, right? Like 14 years from the Fermi pile, we're, you know, splitting atoms in a controlled enough fashion to put electricity on the grid. Like that is an extraordinary uh, set of innovations that occurred. And so I'm wanting to sort of Use you, um, use your kind of encyclopedic mind, your obsessive focus on nuclear for I don't know how many years um, to try and better understand that kind of environment of innovation, what it looked like, what the institutions were, what the institutional ecosystems were to sort of give us some insights into innovation in the 21st century now. So that is a you know very verbose intro, and I'm not sure where I kind of give you the on-ramp to, to jump in there, but um, well, yeah, no, I mean, it, I've, lift, it's, I've lifted it's the gates. Very... Yeah, no, great, 
great topic. Very happy to talk about it. I mean, as you know, I spend a lot of hobby time pouring over the archives, if you will, and trying to understand those exact questions. How exactly did we do this in the past? What went on? And, you know, what were, who were the personalities? What were they like? And, if, and, you know, knowing or studying history is valuable in the sense that there's lots to learn in there. And, um, you can hopefully glean some advice for the future. Of course, context changes as well. So things in the history in the past don't necessarily apply as much now, but still I find it extremely valuable. And the more I've dug in, the more I've just been absolutely amazed at what was done and what was documented and how many just hundreds of thousands of pages and hundreds of thousands of people were working on these problems and putting forth ideas and stepping through them, finding where problems were coming back, iterating. It's just it's like it's like looking into a huge world of um, something that we're trying to replicate. And so I always yes, I'm always looking in there looking for uh, interesting ideas and so on. So i um, absolutely happy to talk about it. Uh, however and and there's there's kind of, you know, there's the famous sort of great man theory of history. And we can certainly and I think we will touch upon uh, Groves uh, with the Manhattan Project or Rickover with the Nautilus and Shipping Port or, you know, I'm not sure what else. And, and obviously those are important personalities. Uh, but also, again, just again, what, what were the kind of innovation environments like? Like, you know, there's no doubt that America is still kind of number one when it comes to uh, software innovation and tech innovation. I, I think that's uh, still a truism. Um, certainly there's, there's rising competition all the time and there's a dynamism and competitiveness and in innovation landscape, which is, you know, thriving out in, uh, in Silicon Valley. But it seems like, um, we're not making much progress, um, when it comes to, uh, innovating in, in, in advanced nuclear, I, I guess, outside of the, you know, like the simulations and the cat, like the computer work, essentially, we're just, we're just not building and deploying. Yeah. Yeah, we've built up a pretty tough environment to build and deploy. I mean, yes, the de the deployment rate right now is dismal. Um, the total amount of electricity in the world or power in, or energy in general made by nuclear is somewhat pathetic. I mean, it's 5% or something like that of total world energy. Um, it's very far from what we had hoped originally that the energy source would be capable of. And now we've sort of plateaued and we're seeing good things here and there. But how exactly do we get back onto that that growth rate that's going to have a significant impact on decarbonizing and providing world energy and so on is something we really need to be seriously looking at. And right, the there's definitely a common statement in, in the West or in the United States where it's like, okay, the existing reactors are old. Those are your parents' reactors or your grandparents' reactors. And uh, they have problems and they have a bunch of baggage. But if you look over here, um, there's all these new types of reactors, innovative reactors, where we finally went ahead and tried to focus on the economics of the system. <laughs> and so we're bringing it forward in a way that for the first time focuses on economics. And that's that attitude sort of um, irks me to a degree in the sense that, <laughs> I mean, since you can find again, tens of thousands of pages from 1944 on where they're saying we need to focus for the first time on the economics in order to have an economically competitive power system. I mean, they had the Hanford pile, they had the submarines um, eventually. Those were nowhere near economical in terms of power generation. So the focus of the commercial industry has always 100% been laser focused on the economics. And to sort of come in and say, oh, let's focus on economics now is basically insulting and and anyway it's it, but, it does, but i think it's i think it comes from a place of ignorance and so that's why i'm always like hey look at this you know enriched lithium cooled NAC reactor from 1965 you know and people are like oh wait a minute that's actually interesting right, so right. there's anyway that's that's a little I, bit I definitely my baseline people joke about sort of back to the future reactors um that a lot of these concepts were tried out in this kind of again heyday of of innovation it seems like a lot of the um the rhetoric around some of the advanced designs is, you know, it infers that existing nuclear is not good enough and we're going to solve all these problems. We're going to make nuclear proliferation proof. We're going to make waste a non-issue. Um, you know, we're going to make a reactor that's so passively safe that, you know, a, a monkey can run it. Um, so it, it's really sort of building off this concept that things, things aren't good enough or that this technology is almost like fatally flawed and maybe there's a way to innovate all of its problems away. And I think a focus of a lot of advocates, myself included, is to say, I mean, every technology comes with some uh, some baggage and some issues that need to be solved. But with nuclear, because of the association with weapons, um, these these issues are blown up into, you know, just to such a degree of hyperbole that it can sort of lead the engineers in the wrong direction in terms of maybe focusing more on economics. We're chasing these un unsolvable, 
you know, apocalyptic problems of, of something like waste, for instance. Well, yeah, I mean, there's it's it's a tough balance. It's very complicated. And but there's a lot of truth to what you're saying. There are parts of light water reactor fleets that are not totally optimal. And it is certainly technically possible and probably actually possible to do better in certain areas. And that is interesting and intriguing. But, um, you know, th there's an issue where, yes, as you're saying, if you say, well, light water reactors aren't safe enough, and so you need something safer. Well, that's basically an anti-nuclear talking point. <laughs> you know, let's, uh, or if, you know, waste is such a huge problem that you need to cut the volume of waste by maybe a half by using a higher burn-up reactor. Well, that's sort of admitting that, well, the current waste that we have is an unsolvable problem. And so those can be counterproductive. And so, yeah, I sort of wish what we had is most of the, I wish the industry was more focused on deploying the technology that we have already good to go, fully licensed, full supply chain, ready to build. Um, and then there was, you know, the profits from that industry ideally would be funding advancements and running ahead on trying to improve the fuel, improve the safety case and so on incrementally. And that would be sort of ideal. But what we're seeing now is that there's sort of two separate industries. There's there's the fleet and there's the advanced nuclear startup companies that are basically completely separated from each other in a sense. Mm -hmm. what, what you're describing sounds, sort of sounds a bit like, uh, you know, situation with Russia and its, you know, sodium fast reactor fleet or China and, and dipping into high temperature gas reactors and molten salt reactors as these kind of side projects. Um, and that, that, that seems sensible. But why don't we actually um, start doing some some history lessons here? And, you know, I, I threw out a few of those dates. And again, they're completely astounding to me, particularly when you compare them to fusion and sort of like the first human induced fusion and sort of where we're at now um, in terms of uh, energy and energy out. But yeah, let's let's just let's just Take us through a little bit of that early history, and I'm sure we'll kind of veer off course into all kinds of awesome tangents, and that's A-OK. -okay. okay, yeah, just direct me, because there's a lot. Um, and yeah, I usually have my my archives to go off, so I'll, this will, my my memory isn't photographic, but I'll, I'll do my best. So, okay, where do we start? So you mentioned, well, fusion. I mean, there were fusion reactions discovered in the, in the mid-30s or early 30s, where we knew that in an accelerator, we could fuse two nuclei and create a totally different atom. And it made a huge amount of energy. It was, in very, it was recognized very early on that there's a bunch of energy in atoms, but no one knew how to get it out. And people thought... Um, People spent a lot of time, even back then, trying to figure out and inventing ways to try to fuse nuclei in a way that could potentially release energy. It was never, no one was, it was impossible. It seemed impossible. There was no way to do it until, I mean, eventually neutrons were discovered and then fission was discovered in 1938. And this was very interesting because with just a little low energy neutron, it's not a huge particle accelerator. It's just a little floating neutron comes along and goes into a uranium atom and it just unlocks this huge amount of energy instantly without any, it's, fr you know, it just, boom, it just opens right up. And that became, and then, the, so that's a miracle in itself that there's so much energy in the atom. And then the other miracle is that it releases two to three extra neutrons, which then can be used in a chain reaction. And so all of a sudden, everyone immediately realized there's this actually practical potential way to unlock vast amounts uh, of the energy in the nucleus. And of course, because of the context, it was the world wars. I mean, the conflict in Europe was coming up. That was, this was turned into a weapon first. Well, it was effort was focused on a weapon first and along the way Fermi indeed did demonstrate that you could get a chain reacting nuclear reaction in, in as you said December 2nd 1942 that's a famous date um as we'll come back to <laughs> so, so we um, obviously don't have time to like deep dive the Manhattan yeah, project yeah. And I'm, I'm gonna no, do yeah. I will I've, I've got a Manhattan project expert we're gonna talk to shortly but just yeah I won't let, let's we'll let's talk about yeah, I mean, again, just uh, just I want to I want to answer this question of how we get from Meitner right, right. to the, let's just say the Nautilus. Let's just say PWR right. and a freaking submarine. Well, let and me we I'll stop like jump. in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah let let go, me, for it, go for it. I, I, just a little bit on the Manhattan Project. So they they had to make very pure graphite um, in order to go critical, and so there's this huge supply chain. They had to work with industry to make vast amounts of very pure graphite. There was a boron impurity that was that would prevent the chain reaction. So. It became there was this establishment between nuclear standards, uh, purity standards are extremely sort of unbelievably high. No, one, there, it was less than a part per million of boron required. So there was an establishment of 
nuclear people and industry working together to establish obscenely ridiculous um, specifications. And then, okay, let's fast forward. 1944, Hanford piles are up and running. Those guys then did the world's first reactor innovation sessions. They had a whole year where they sat around and came up with every crazy reactor you can imagine. Basically, every reactor you've ever heard of has been published in 1944 uh, in this thing they called the New Piles Committee. It was just like a bunch of scientists and applied physicists kind of playing around. So, so most people are familiar with the the Fermi pile, just a whole bunch of graphite and I mean, can you describe it quickly? And then just the Hanford pile, is that similar or different? Then we'll yeah, talk about sure. Um, yeah, so they, yes, it's, they, <laughs> I won't go into it, but they they found out that if you if you separate um, your fuel, they had sort of uh, spheres or cylinders of fuel, and they found out that if you separate that fuel from blocks of graphite, you, there's this huge neutronic advantage. Basically, the neutrons can uh, slow down in peace in the moderator, avoiding absorption in uranium, and then come back to cause a fission. It turns out it's more likely to cause a fission if it's a slow neutron in natural uranium than uh, a fast neutron. So it's just a bunch of like, imagine just a bunch of spheres and about this big of uranium in graphite blocks, maybe this big in this big lattice. It was, you know, it was a squash court filled with little interspersed 3D grid of, of fuel and graphite blocks. And it had no cooling channels. It was very low power. They couldn't run it more than half a watt because the shielding requirements would dose the people around it to in a, at a dangerous level. So they ran it at half a watt um, and did a little bit of study. And then and then that evolved to the graph to the Hanford pile by uh, which was very similar, but they needed it to be much higher power because the rate of plutonium production is proportional to how fast you're splitting atoms. Mm. And if you're splitting atoms faster, that makes a bunch of extra heat. Uh, they didn't want the heat. If they were making plutonium, they just want plutonium, but they have to move the heat somehow. And so they decided the absolutely easiest way to do There was a big debate between helium coolant, which they thought they needed, and water coolant. And they decided uh, Wigner decided it was possible to go critical with water with natural uranium. And so they it's a graphite thing, but instead of 3D uh, spacing of fuel, they had tubes of fuel and they flowed water from the river. It was actually direct once through cooling. So like water came from the river, went through the core, and then went right back out to the river. There was no wow. heat exchange or anything. Anyway, wow. and that thing, and then you could slide the slugs of fuel through the cylinders and they would pop out the back into a giant vat which they would then do chemistry on and pull the plutonium out. sounds like a can do <laughs> yeah <laughs> a little bit <laughs> there's something similar <laughs> yeah right right uh, so th these hanford piles were, were plutonium production reactors yes and yeah. they were they were the first tr high power reactors with actual cooling well um there was an air-cooled mini reactor at oak ridge called x10 but yes they were plutonium production reactors they were pretty low temperature they didn't make steam that would be useful for making electricity uh they had aluminum cladding that couldn't go to very high temperature without corroding and so on so yes they were very they were just for making plutonium but they were pretty big they were 200 megawatts and they made three of them wow. right in a row and so you're, you're and you're saying you're saying that uh, all sorts of conversations uh, happened around this. Uh, this yeah. Uh, so must have been a so very... then the yeah. Let me. I'll, so then the conversation turns like, okay, we're making plutonium for weapons. That's horrible. Let's. How can we do something good for civilization with this technology? And that's when the conversation turned to like, how should we make economical electric power? What can we do to make actually, you know, how can we compete with fossil fuel? And that's where all these crazy ideas started coming in. And they had reactors where with gaseous uranium coolant that would compress with a piston and then, you know, like a basically like a reciprocating engine. They had a bunch of heavy water reactors where pistons would slide the slurry of fuel from one side to another going through a reflector region, which would go critical and then cause um, power to come out. I mean, the the craziness level and sort of the ingenuity it was just astounding but eventually you know uh, people were like all right let's get serious what's actually going to work and there was this big moment when uh there was a realization that a water-cooled water-moderated reactor could actually be neutronically interesting this is sort of an interesting story but i don't know if you want to go into it but when it at first they thought water in a lattice of fuel was nowhere near it was 0.9 needing 1.0 on k infinity for natural uranium but there was an effect that they totally missed out which is that if you bring the fuel close together uh fast neutrons can go from one pin to another and cause a fission in the neighboring pin this effect doesn't happen in graphite because the fast neutrons rarely make it to another piece of fuel but in a really tight lattice now you have a fast fission effect, and that brought K-infinity of a natural uranium water-cooled, water-moderated reactor 
almost to one. Like it was so close to one that it became interesting. And so people like Elvin Weinberg were like, wait a minute, regular water in a very much more compact core with just regular water as both the, the coolant and the moderator is super convenient. I mean, that's everybody knows water. We have water equipment. It's very compact. Um, what an interesting potential concept. And so he started promoting that. And of course, eventually the the Navy got interested in that. And he met and worked with Admiral or Captain Rickover at the time. Anyway, Rickover, whatever his rank was in, in 1946. And that's when we really started kicking off the development of the first um, naval power reactor. However, um, even then, it was thought there was no one thought that the water cooled, water moderated reactor would be economical at all. And and there was <laughs> when people said, "Well, let's try to commercialize a water reactor," the, there was huge pushback against it because it was thought because it's so inefficient with uranium, it doesn't. It's not a breeder. It only burns half a percent of the natural uranium. And right. at the time, they thought uranium was extremely scarce, and so the absolute focus was on breeder reactors. That's why EBR1 was the first electricity producing reactor. It was a, they built a breeder back then because they thought the only way to have commercial power would be to use breeders because the fuel costs would just be too ridiculously right. high for everything else. And so I, I guess you could justify uh, like a naval nuclear propulsion on the, even, even in a world of constrained uranium because of just the incredible advantages that uh, you know, a nuclear powered submarine gives you. So even if it's uneconomical, we can divert it for a strategic benefit. Is that yes, maybe the rationale? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. You don't care about competing with coal in a submarine because you have the nuclear advantage of not needing oxygen and having, uh, you know, decades of fuel inside. One thing makes it for the first time ever a true submersible. And they went on these great adventures around the world under, you know, submerged in one trip and up to the North Pole and so on. And that's only made possible because of the technical advantages of using nuclear power in a submarine. And so the cost doesn't matter. And, and also you're never going to even if you're extremely inefficient with uranium, it doesn't matter because you're not powering the world with submarines. You're just making a, a couple hundred max to defend yourself or whatever. So right, yeah. Right, right. So so again, what's what's special about this environment? I imagine innovation benefits from having, you know, I'm not sure what percentage of GDP was going into the Manhattan Project, for instance, or these Hanford piles, but obviously, <laughs> oh, you know, wow. flows of cash, good. Flows of cash, good. And then you know, as I understand it, we've sort of moved through eras, right? We had sort of the more of the sort of chemistry era preceding this in which, you know, a lot of great discoveries were made, I think mostly, in, well, many in Germany, for instance, a number of different processes, Fischer, Tropp, Haber, Bosch, etc. All kinds of uh, dyes and medicines and things like that. We move into this kind of age of physics, and we've kind of proceeded in, I guess, more, more recently into an age of uh, biotechnology and, um, you know, uh, decoding the human genome and, and on into software. So, is that like another element, I guess, is just the human resources. This is kind of where it's at. This is the exciting area. If you're really, really smart, you're going to go into this area. But what, what else are like, if you had to sort of come up with like three or four reasons why all this innovation happened, um, what, what would they be? Okay, let's see. So yeah, great point. And that's absolutely the that eye of Sauron of innovation was on nuclear at that time. So what are the things? So national imperative is one thing. I mean, do this by any means or be destroyed by the Nazis is a pretty good motivator. And that built up a lot of alignment and sort of brought in very centrally controlled, nobody knew what the other person was doing type Manhattan Project stuff. And it was an unbelievably huge expense, incredible uh an incredible achievement. And so that was, I mean, that really is a, a first thing that laid the groundwork that had lots of people trained up, lots of industries scaled up. And so, and then, and then boom, Hey world, we have created or discovered an absolute new, we have a secret weapon that no one's ever heard of. I mean, it's straight out of science fiction. Our scientists went and unlocked a fundamental power of the universe and it's going to change everything. And everybody, I mean, every comic book, every high school mascot was nuclear related in the early 50s. And I mean, it was just, it was extremely interesting. Everybody poured into it. Popular science had dozens of articles about, you know, nuclear power, this, nuclear power, that. The, the, new, the Jetsons future was here and everybody... And went into it. And then but and then the government kept pouring more and more money in or originally for Cold War reasons, you know, ramping up weapons capability, building more reactors for weapons and then building the submarine uh, system. That was another huge industry that, you know, was a government imperative. And so that just built up this massive in infrastructure, huge industries. There's quotes from Rickover in Congress where he's saying they're like, well, are you having trouble finding material? 
And he says, like fuel? And they say, no, not just that, but like zirconium. And he's like, we built an industry of zirconium. I mean, they had to go out and make... There were, you know, super pure uh, zirconium, which again, it's high temperature, corrosion resistant, low neutron absorbing material. So they built by government imperative for military reasons, uh, an entire supply chain. And then uh, everybody was super excited about it. Everybody went into it, as you're saying, and everybody wanted to be the one who brought forth this world changing um, energy source that was going to bring forth a high energy future and all the sci-fi things that come with that so i mean we can't under we can't understate how important those those like two or three government programs in a row were i mean manhattan project cold war weapons complex and submarine propulsion not to mention army reactors and air force reactors which are also huge programs so i mean there's just this unbelievable injection of public money into it and then a bunch of people who really wanted to turn it into something that would be beneficial for civilian purposes as well that's that's what happened then whether or not that's required or essential for continued innovation now is a little bit i don't it shouldn't be i mean it would be great to get more people excited and into it and that is happening i will say like with the nuclear startup thing it's become cool again to work in in nuclear uh certainly fusion has always been cool but now there's a lot of there's money coming in from private sources uh billionaires effectively who are saying i want to change the world and i want to help out with some kind of and now it's driven by climate concerns energy scarcity so let's let's fund all these people going in and so now there's a bunch of cool people you've got young folks working on cool nuclear things both in fission and fusion and that's so that's kind of bringing that element of it back in a sense but that's that's rushing ahead so i can stay focused yeah i mean (laughs) something i've been reflecting upon and, and it just seems like this would be a really basic thing to do is to look around the world who's succeeding at deploying right now and what are the characteristics of those, you know, socioeconomic political systems? What are, what are those kind of ecosystems of private companies and public companies and, uh, you know, departments of energy, et cetera? How, how, does it, how is it all working out? And, you know, the degree to which those are replicable in the U.S., maybe in the 1960s U.S., 1970s U.S., but there's been a real transformation in terms of the idea of the role of government um, in the economy. And, and, you know, I think in strategic industry and as we've offshored a lot of heavy industry, even more so. Um, but, uh, you know, again, if you look, if you know, look at Russia, China, I'm thinking of Rosatom and just this vertical integration that goes all the way down. It's kind of sounds similar to what you're describing here. There's a bit of a national imperative. You know, I mean, the weapons thing is obviously still there, but also we want to export nuclear reactors. We want to do it efficiently. We want to be the number one in the world on that. We're going to make sure that we've got everything in terms of the, the whole fuel cycle, the waste management, the reactors on deck, and we can sell them around the world. Um, yeah, with that objective I mean, it, in mind... And that kind of like singular focus, you can see that that might be pretty efficient, despite claims that you know state state ownership or or uh, stewardship of a process by definition makes it ineffective, ineffective or uninnovative. I'm not sure what your what your thoughts are there. Yeah, I mean you're right. I mean if you look around the world and see who's doing well, they're all vertically integrated, state owned organizations. Even in Korea, I mean it's utility and vendor combined. You know, Kepco is sort of they <laughs> they design it, construct it, sometimes operate it. And that's how it was in France. That's how, um, and that's how it certainly is in China and, and Russia. And so that's, that certainly it works and is working right now. But there's, yeah, there's, I mean, with the democratic Western nations, it's just not the style of operation that people want to run huge projects in, um, unless there's some, except, you know, if there's a Manhattan project or an Apollo project or something. Right, so it's like, right, we sometimes choose right. to focus on that. But I think there's enough controversy around nuclear. I mean, it's had a whole history and plenty of baggage and so on that now there isn't a unified national alignment uh, with no opposition or minimal opposition that says, yeah, let's just do sort of a centrally planned nuclear deployment. Let's pick a standard technology that we know works and build back, build back up that supply chain and start trying to deploy them and compete with these state-owned actors who are exporting VVERs to Nigeria and so on at, at extremely low yeah. cost. Like <laughs> that's hard to compete yeah. with. Um, what, what, so- what do you think about, <laughs> what, what do you think about this? Cause I'm, I, again, I'm trying to, um, you know, red team my ideas and not be too simplistic. Right. And so, you know, and, and I've heard pushback that, Hey, no, the U S bucked this trend there. They didn't have a France like deployment, which again, that's not communism. That's again, I think the the term, and it sounds horrible in English, is dirigisme, but like basically, or dirigiste, like a role of the state directing things. Uh, and again, that was, 
not a Manhattan project, but it was a response to a major energy crisis where they had no gas, they had no coal, they were burning oil, and the price of oil went up. Um, and so there was a real strategic energy security imperative to get something going fast to underpin your entire power generation system. So one can see the West is capable of going, hey, there's a role for the state here when it's when it's a national security or national energy security um, motivation. But in the US, um, you know, the historic deployments, 60s, 70s, and 80s, um, that wasn't some big state-led project as far as I understand. But what do you think about this idea that a utility is kind of like a state? You know, if it's a large enough utility, it has a huge rate base, that's kind of like having a tax base. Um, you know, that there's some similarities anyway, in terms of even a big private US utility in a, in a regulated market. Yeah, I mean, that's a tough call. I mean, first of all, not to jump on this, but there was a massive, I mean, the program by which light water reactors were commercialized in the United States was driven by a, a cooperative government program called the, the Power Demonstration Reactor Project. And it was a huge uh, project that developed all sorts of different kind of reactors. And it just turns out that the light water reactors outperform dozens of other types of non light water reactors. And we can, we can talk about that. Let's deep, no, no, let's, I want okay. to right now. Let's, let's <laughs> okay, do that. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, so it's 19, early 1950s. The UK has Calder Hall. They're building a big power plant with a gas cooled reactor. Soviets have just announced that they've got a little five megawatt reactor on the grid. And the U S Congress is like, we are falling behind the other countries. We need to develop nuclear power because Cold War, because we're going to fall behind right. technologically, and whoever develops this is going to have a huge advantage and so on. So there was this big interest across the board of developing economical nuclear power. And so uh, the Atomic Energy Commission created, with congressional support, something called the Power Demonstration Reactor Project. It was a reactor project for power demonstration. And they put out three rounds of sort of requests for bid, and they said, hey, who of you out there would like government assistance developing a, a reactor that's going to maybe compete with coal economically? Coal was the only competition at the time, really. And so what happened was um, consortiums of utilities came out and they paired up with like a reactor vendor. So maybe you get like 12 utilities partner up with um with Atomics International, and they put together a proposal and they sent it to the Atomic Energy Commission. It says, we're going to build a low pressure, sodium cooled, graphite moderated, high temperature reactor. It's going to be super, have high thermal efficiency, use almost no uranium at all, it uses 1% enriched uranium. And we're going to, it's going to, it has a high likelihood of uh, achieving commercial parity. And then the AEC would look at it and be like, yeah, okay, we agree. They had criteria. Is it likely to offset coal? How much is it going to cost us? And how mature is the technology already based on previous reactor experiments? And so a bunch of reactors came through and the Atomic Energy Commission approved lots of them. And they would say, okay, we will, at the time, only the Atomic Energy Commission could own fuel. So what they, what they did is they would lease fuel to the utility and then charge them for usage of that fuel. So like, and they, they would take wow. the fuel back and reprocess it. And they always, they reprocess wow. pretty much everything because it was so, it was so rare at the time. Um, and so they said, okay, we'll waive your fuel usage charges. We'll waive your heavy water charges. We will pr subsidize a bunch of R and D related to it, but you will, um, finance the design, the construction, operation, owning the facility. And so it was kind of, a lot of them came in, the utility consortium would pay 30 million, Atomic Energy Commission would pay 5 million or something like that. It's all over the place, but there, there's a big variety of that. And people came in with, like I said, sodium graphite reactors, Fermi one, sodium cooled fast breeder reactor was um, 26 utilities who had come together to do that. They form a corporation and, uh, but, but, there was more government support with that one with more R&D. So the government was providing lots of R&D uh, and, and the fuel charges. But it was really, it was by and large, in, the, in that first round, it was by and large coming from these big risk diversified consortium, consortia of utilities. Well, then small utilities weren't getting involved and Congress was told to do it. I mean, they wanted to have it go out in rural America too. And so, but none of the small utilities could finance or build or operate their own reactor. And so they did a round two. And in round two of the power demonstration reactor project program, um, the AEC would build, own and operate the nuclear side of it. The utility would build, own and operate the, the turbine and power conversion and provide the site and the land and all the wires and so on and then the aec would run the plant for five years and then sell it to the utility if the utility wanted it or the utility could just decline it at which point the aec was mandated to 
to, to tear down the reactor. And so there's wow. lots of examples. <laughs> so and th that history is just littered with reactors that the utility was like, nah, like, I don't want it. So like Hallam. Okay, is so, great, so sorry, yeah, give us some examples. Yeah, yeah. so ha Hallam, um, my favorite reactor was in Nebraska. It's the sodium cool graphite moderated reactor. Really genius idea. It was um, it's elegant. I mean, I agree that it's like highly likely to be super economical. Um, so it's not a sodium cooled fast reactor. It's a sodium cooled slow reactor because it has graphite blocks in it. And again, that gives you all the high temperature, low pressure advantages of sodium coolant. But you only need like one or two percent enriched uranium instead of halu or plutonium or whatever. But it was early in the sodium world and the sodium and the, the graphite moderator cans leaked and sodium came in and it swelled. And so they had operational challenges. It just wasn't operating effectively, even though the concept was brilliant and, and on paper it was absolutely mind blowing. But the thing didn't operate well. It could have been fixed. But by the time it came for, for the utility to choose to buy it in Nebraska, they were just like, nah. We don't want it. They had actually built a coal plant that fed into the same exact turbine because that high temperature machine was compatible with the steam from a coal plant. So it was literally, it was a nuclear plant on one side, coal plant on the other side, and one turbine. And the coal plant wow. fed it whenever the nuclear plant was down. And since the coal plant was feeding it so much, they were like, forget it, we don't care about that. So, so now that coal plant is still in operation um, and the nuclear plant, just, so there's a, you can look at the satellite pictures, like green field where the nuclear plant was, turbine coal plant and a big mile long wow. coal train. But anyway, another example is uh, Pequa. Piqua um, is a small town in Ohio, and they, the city of Piqua, this little tiny town, put in a proposal that said, we want an organic cooled, organic moderated reactor. This is using like some kind of the hippie oil. reactor. Yeah, yeah, the organic. But it's like a, it's called terfenyl. The, it's, a, it's like an oil type of mineral oil type of coolant, which has a lot of, again, high temperature, low pressure. That thing, but the problem with it has radiation instability. So radiation sort of breaks the organic chains and you get it, it turns into tar and gunks up everything um <laughs> and so that reactor similarly they built it um they operated it for had problems they were they said they could fix it they probably could have fixed it but the utility was like hell no get that thing out of my face <laughs> and they shut it down and anyway and and uh, what others there was uh Peach Bottom high temperature gas cooled reactor was in that program. A couple superheat VWRs, Bonus in Puerto Rico was part of that program. Um, there were, yeah, Fermi One obviously had operational troubles with the, the core melt and other just operational issues. It just was a premature time for sodium cooled reactors back then. That was way back. And so, again and again and again, these um, advanced quote unquote non water reactors were just hard to operate even though they were awesome on paper they didn't perform and so people shut them down you know what did perform was the regular water cool the pwrs and vwrs performed beautifully i mean they had a couple of problems but compared to the non-water systems they were like awesome and so everybody was like hmm as good as even though they don't they aren't that efficient with their uranium well, it looks like there's a lot more uranium than we thought and so maybe that issue isn't so much a pressing concern we found Tons of uranium in the West. Everybody, you know, there's an I Love Lucy in the 50s where they go out uranium hunting. Like it was that big of a deal. Like everybody's out finding uranium. Um, and so it's like, well, okay, if we don't care that much about uranium efficiency right now, and these reactors are operating extremely reliably and they're relatively easy to run, then let's just build those. And so you have this graph. I made a little plot of the reactors and you can see just a couple years couple years couple years couple years and then there's a bunch that go out into the 90s of these little tiny uh 50 and so megawatt pwrs and vwrs and that's what happened like that's why utilities chose pwrs and vwrs over all the other higher performance reactors higher performance on paper that were just too difficult to operate they didn't operate well uh, and that's really why we have pwrs and, and vwrs today is that is that what uh, like Rickover's famous paper reactor letter was um, describing, or <laughs> how, well, how do you so interpret the, that? When was it written? What was it? Yeah, yeah, what was the context in which he wrote that? that? That's something I've wondered. So that was no. So that letter was written in 1953, whereas this program was happening from like you know 55 to 65 or 70. So that letter was from before this program. So I've wondered like how the hell did Rickover know to write the paper reactor memo in 19? 53. I mean, how many reactors were there? Well, so, I, and I think I have a lead on it at this point. So when he went to 
he went to Oak Ridge. He was sent to Oak Ridge to learn about nuclear technology right after World War II um, with a group of six Navy officers. And he was sat there with Alvin Weinberg and all these scientists at what became or sort. It's, it's the prototype of any nuclear reactor or nuclear engineering university program. They had it at Oak Ridge to begin with. And they went and they, they spent a lot of time designing kind of goofy reactors. They had like a senior design project almost. And so, but their, their big focus in 1946 was this thing called the Daniels pile. It was a pebble bed, high temperature gas cooled reactor developed by a guy named Farrington Daniels in, in the, a couple of years earlier in like 1944. And it was, yeah, it's, it's basically exactly a pebble bed reactor, helium cooled, um, triso like pebbles and the he rickover was looking at it and the scientists were like look at it, it's beautiful it's high efficiency high temperature and so on and rickover was like kind of staring at it, and he started asking questions he came from he had an extremely mature engineering background at this point and we can we can rewind on his history in a second but i mean he had been he's he's been in the engine room of ships for decades and he knows like how equipment works on ships and ship in ship environments and he starts asking about uh, helium leakage, radiated helium. What happens if the gas leaks? How do you stop it? How do you repair it? Um, what happens if this breaks? How, what's the maintenance look like? And he quickly realized that that reactor was just a crazy idea, had no basis in reality. And so he told, <laughs> he t I mean, at the time, which isn't totally true, it was developed later and works fine-ish. Um, but at the time, he was like, this is not what we want for submarines. Like, this is not anywhere. So he got his Navy people to stop working on that thing and just sort of study and learn and ask questions. And that's when, and that's where he talked to Weinberg and eventually went with, he didn't know if he wanted water at first. He, he had to choose between, he did have two candidate coolants. It was water and sodium and they built a water cooled um, submarine and they built a sodium cooled submarine. Those are the first sort of two big projects. And it turns out, well, so anyway, but that was after the memo. So, um, in 1953, he was he must have been referring to uh, like the scientists at Orsort because he he wrote in his later memoirs and his writings on this that he's like he lost trust in scientists at that point. He knew scientists were nice and he knew they had a lot to say, but he realized that they did not understand the practicalities of maintenance operation, reliability, quality. And so he totally he shifted in his thought. And I'm pretty sure that that memo was written based on discussions from Orsort and the following couple of years where people came out with reactor ideas because they did. You can find that some of the great uh, reactor designs come out of those early publications where they have like design studies. That's where like, again, if, if it wasn't in the 1944, it was coming out of Oak Ridge, uh, that school in, in the in the late 40s, basically molten salt reactors and so on. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> God, I've got so many questions spinning in my head. Uh, out of those questions, one one thing I think I think James Crowlinstein brought this up when sort of talking about um, the relative performance of uh, of the water moderate and water cooled reactors, um, and basically was saying, listen, like since the Industrial Revolution, we've got two hundred and fifty ish years of managing you know pressure vessels and high temperature steam. Um, you know, we've we've had a chance to troubleshoot that for hundreds of years, and we just haven't had that with um, you know the molten salts or with uh, you know liquid. Uh, uh, sodium or, or high temperature gas reactors is that sort of a similar read that we just need more time to to troubleshoot some of the peculiarities of the technology or are there you know is there a and that i'm you know a, a larger stream of experience that i'm not aware of using molten salts in some other way or or using sodium as a coolant is this just particularities to nuclear or i mean i wouldn't i don't i certainly don't think we will never develop a fully reliable sodium or molten salt or gas cooled system. I mean, it should, there's nothing inherent about the physics that would prevent that from being possible. And indeed, I've, I mean, I've worked on those kind of things for years m thinking that it will be meaningful and helpful. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I think it certainly is just a, a matter of finding an environment where you can shake it down long enough in sort of fleet mode, not on paper, not in a small experiment, but like in fleet mode, to be able to really work through the problems in a way that doesn't kill you from the valley of death in terms of like, oops, that was supposed to be fully commercialized and it's not competing with natural gas right now. And so let's shut it down. Like it's, it's too hard to get that prototype going and then have some problem that's going to cost the price of the prototype to fix. And everyone's just like, nah, I'm not going to do it. So how do you get over that? I don't really know. And there are, there are other, I mean, there are some inherent, well, there's pros and cons of all the coolants, but I mean, there's things like, 
sodium activates and becomes thousands of times more radioactive than water. And so in a submarine environment, you have this much larger source term just from the activated coolant that you have to shield than water. And so in certain environments, I mean, that's challenging. Like there's no way, there's no magical shielding material. Like you have to put in more shielding to deal with highly activated coolant. So if you're, so that those kind of things, and Rick Over will tell stories about when they had the sea wolf and they parked it next to, you know, a water cooled reactor. The people in the water cooled reactor were getting more dose from the activated sodium. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's just like that, that's sort of an inherent problem. But that's that's specific to a summary. You can build as much shielding as you want around a commercial power plant. So uh yes, yeah, so there's there's no reason that it sh- it's not it's certainly possible to make a well operating molten salt gas cooled or so. You, you said there's you said there's no uh, like the physics you know there, there's no kind of physics based reason, but is there like an engineering based reason? And, and like I, I like that dichotomy of Rick over as this experienced mechanical engineer going to I forget that or off or whatever and saying oh these scientists right and I, it reminds me a little bit of fusion where it's like you know it's an incredible science project, but you know a lot of these machines are just, you know, like Toko asked, they're just trying to eat themselves. Like there are these machines that are trying to destroy themselves. So is there from an, are they just harder from an engineering perspective or, uh, well, <laughs> or, or just more troubleshooting? Is required? Yeah, it's, they're absolutely harder from an engineering perspective. I mean, all the coolants we're talking about um, in terms of maintenance, it's harder to go in and maintain a coolant when the, when there's, if you get in there, like humans need air to survive, but if sodium interacts with air, you know, it has a combustion reaction. And so maintenance is more challenging. It's just actually more challenging. Same with molten salt. If you have a a molten salt that's either activated or has fuel in it and you want to go chop up a pipe and replace it, well, it's easy in a water cooler. Actually, you drain the water and put a new person and weld it. But try doing that in like an extremely radioactive environment. It's much it is it is technically more challenging. And so but there's advantages. I mean, you can have these massive performance increases if you do it. So there's a big it's a tantalizing goal and there's potential there. But yes, the actual when you focus on reliability, maintainability, those things are extremely challenging and require a lot of work. And it's not like you can't just build one of them and think it's a sure thing. You have to get into fleet mode to really understand the overall reliability. So it's like, it's really like- hard to jump into that. Often I'll hear like, well, EBR2 proved that, you know, this, you know, my reactor concept is fine and ready to, for commercial operations or the molten salt reactor experiment proves that this is a mature technology and it's ready for deployment. And I can see you kind of chuckling, but, you know, and the Russians have had a sodium fast reactor program going, I think, for like nigh on 40 years at this point. Yeah, I'm more than that. Completely yeah, misinformed. Since, yeah, so um, ER5 or whatever. Yeah. And, and I'm fascinated by this idea of just reactor years of operation. So from what I understand, like the, the water-cooled, water-moderated systems have something like seventeen or 18,000 years of uh, reactor years of operation in which to troubleshoot and learn. What's your sense of those numbers for molten salt reactors or sodium fast reactors <laughs> well, and gas? I know it for sodium. temperature gas reactors. I know the number for sodium fast reactors is around 450 reactor years or so. Lots of countries have built lots of sodium cooled reactors. Most of them fast reactors. Only a few of these sodium cooled slow reactors have operated. Um, but yeah, so it's like 450 or something like that is in sodium. For molten salt, I mean, it's like... <laughs> four <laughs> it's like all molten salt four reactor years. experiment yeah um there was also there's the aircraft reactor experiment which ran before that that was a molten salt reactor it ran for about four days um so that one doesn't add too many years and then actually china has completed uh, a a thorium molten salt reactor experiment very similar to msre and that's been licensed to turn on i'm waiting for that thing to turn on any moment so they will They'll fire that thing up and they'll get more information similar to what MSRE was providing and hopefully advance the state of knowledge. I'm sure they will. It's, I'm glad they started it up or they they built it. But um, so anyway, that'll go from four to 10, hopefully soon. Uh, gas cold reactors, there's lots more experience. Germany had a couple up and running or at least one, the AB, ABR. Anyway, I'm I'm slightly rusty there. And we had Peach Bottom, we had Port St. Brain, um, which were big reactors. And we had a couple little small reactor experiments along those lines as well. So, But anyway, it's not much. <laughs> it's a lot less than sodium. Sodium is like the second most mature or experienced uh, technology. And, and as you say, like the Russians have done it continuously for since the 50s or 60s. Uh, and they, I mean, they're in a situation where they never shut down their 
sodium program. They've been running commercial, the only commercial sodium cooled fast reactors, and they're still building PWR, VVERs. And in fact, they've said things like, well, we can't quite get our sodium cooled reactors to economically compete with our own pressurized water reactors. And so, but they have certain advantages in terms of uh, transmuting waste and uh, breeding fuel and so on that we think we're going to have like a few of these sodium cooled reactors providing fuel cycle services to a big fleet of PWRs. And that's kind of a traditional fuel cycle idea that lots of big national nuclear planning organizations will show these days. So, but they, I mean, even after all that experience, they're kind of saying like, well, it's, we're still struggling and maybe we can get economically competitive when we go bigger to the, to the BN 1200. But it just goes to show Not small that, modular, but large, but large, yeah, large, large. They're going large, large, large. Right. They think that's what they need to do. But then they're also saying, well, maybe, you know, let's try this lead cooled thing. And so they're doing lead cooled reactors as well, just because maybe they maybe they're concerned that they're hitting some kind of wall in terms of economic performance with their sodium systems. So you anyway, but that you could argue that like, OK, maybe sodium is not uh, as economic. So let's try something else. No one's gotten even close uh, to that level of experience with something like a molten salt reactor. We just don't know. Uh, we, we've certainly proven that you can run a, a heat generating molten salt reactor with MSRE. But we haven't proven that you can build a reliable, well-operated power plant. That is completely unknown. It should be doable, but someone has to prove it. And the utilities are very conservative and they aren't going to they're going to. They want it to be proven before they go build a bunch of them. So with all this in mind, why, I mean, I'll, I'll forgive Andrew Yang, uh, U.S. presidential candidate who basically just molten salt thorium reactors are going to save the world. Um, but in terms of, you know, people that I think are and maybe should be better informed, um, and I, I'm trying to be very diplomatic here, I probably already put my foot in my mouth, but like, why is the gestalt in the U.S. right now? around like what the way i'm trying to explain it is well there's this great pride as there should be in the development of the uh, pwr and bwr america has been the foremost sort of uh origin of of nuclear reactor technology development um and we can't deploy so we'll just cling to that pride and say hey we're, we're the most innovative we're, we're generating lots of cool new concepts but like the whole focus um seems to be in terms of uh, again this uh I'm calling it gestalt, that might not be the best word, right? But in terms of the overall environment and, and what's being talked about in the U.S., you know, I think uh, it, it's it's very advanced, uh, halo, et cetera, focused. Is that just because of not paying attention to history and to, you know, for instance, what's what's been happening in Russia and having this PWR fleet as the basis and, and running some experiments on the side? And mm, yeah, I, I, what, I, what's your take culturally on, yeah, on, on culturally what what's happening my take on this, my opinion from what I've seen or talked to people about is that, yeah, there are people who are coming in saying, hey, nuclear should be good, uh, but nuclear has a bad rap. And so I am going to do, as I was saying earlier, I'm just going to do something so much better because I'm so much more innovative than those people in the past. And we have the, I have this phrase, it's like those guys were idiots. Like the people, these hundreds of thousands of people in old nuclear like didn't know about economics or they didn't think about manufacturing, which is... Is, is, so it's there is an arrogance that's just wrong. It's just misinformed where they think um, those people weren't innovative enough. And now I, the big genius that I am, am going to come in and push out something that just blows away the performance of the people in the past. And I think they truly believe that. And that's one of the reasons I like, again, to dwell on nuclear history, to show how exotic and sophisticated and, and economically focused people were. Not really just to prove the point that... Um, there's lots to be learned and the knowledge level starts very low and uh, the troubles that you run into are not obvious at first. And just running an MCMP model of a core that goes critical uh, and runs for a couple of years means nothing at all. I mean, you might as well, I mean, you're not, you haven't even started. You have to really do so much more than that. And so it's just a lack of sophistication, a lack of knowledge of the history and an arrogance that makes people think, that they're just going to swoop in here with a team of three people and pound out a revolutionary nuclear technology. Now, so that, I mean, there's also the idea that large light water reactors in the U.S. are just stalled out, like no utility is ever going to buy another one that people say. I don't think that's true, and I hope that's not true, and I wish people more people were focused on 
innovating around how to deploy more reactors that we already have. I mean, if we want to decarbonize rapidly, we should focus most of the effort on rapidly deploying known technology and a little bit of the effort on what's the next thing once we sort of have that big, big problem solved. That would be sort of my ideal. But it, it reflects the, the nation's focus. I mean, the people in general don't know a thing about nuclear history, obviously. Like, who knows about it? Just a bunch of... <laughs> um, and and they feel like old nuclear is, like, old and bad. And so when, the, when it turns out that pe- part of civilization who has lots of money and wants to invest that money in helping in the energy world, they think, well, the right thing to do would be advanced nuclear as opposed to no one wants to get in there and like help make the light water reactors more efficient or like deploy the next uh the next light water reactor in a way that's bring in the the south koreans to build an apr 1400 in the u.s that would be an awesome startup company i wish somebody made that startup company but um but that's just not you know my in my in my humble experience, which is very little, um, you know, but also being based up here in Ontario, where I think there is some credibility with an organization like OPG doing these kind of refurbishments, which are not building a new reactor, but it's very complex work. Tons of you know the critical path is insane. So many inputs, so many opportunities for things to go wrong, and and pulling it off. And that's not sexy, or it's not really giving you a VC type return. Um, but that kind of institutional excellence seems to be what ultimately makes nuclear deployable and at least the capital expense part economical and hey the operating expense as well you need that kind of institutional excellence and and whatnot and i think it's far easier to kind of get wetted and imagine ideas like well some guys in a lab you know doing some computer sims are going to make this huge breakthrough and and frankly i think like a lot of that money that's coming into nuclear from the vc side is coming out of silicon valley and have had miracles of of disruption in terms of uh technology components software uh, and so it's it's totally natural that you know they would see nuclear be techno optimists you know want to make some money but also want to you know save the world and 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 sort of see this frustratingly slow moving technology and and say hey can we can we disrupt this somehow? i i totally get that impulse yeah i, I mean i yeah, part, i'm like really conflicted because part of me is like thank goodness somebody is like getting excited about nuclear and pouring money in and developing young new people and learning all sorts of cool stuff like this is great this is an absolutely good thing and then uh, the other part of me is like um geez well the likely the overall likelihood of disrupting through this approach may be lower than people expect so I don't know. I, I'm certainly conflicted about it. I am. <laughs> I, I don't have the all the answers to sort of solving that issue. So yeah, I sort of feel like let's just let's just change the proportions. Like more people focus on LWR deployment and focus, and like, and maybe we can just grow the the pie in general. But let's try to get a little right. bit more focus on that known technology and a little bit less over obsession with like the brilliant innovator who swoops in and saves everything. Like, I think we're a little bit obsessed with that concept or the concept of innovation when, I mean, Rick over to built the entire nuclear industry, not just submarines, but he then through shipping port built the commercial nuclear industry as well. And he did it through basically what can only be described as like extremely hard work, ridiculous specifications <laughs> and kind of like, being very grumpy and and angering a lot of people and that's it shouldn't have to be that way that's not the only way to do it but it is true that that's what made reliable reactors i mean it wasn't just a crazy crazy fun interesting ideas it was extremely hard work detailed specifications and careful testing and a lot of money I th- yeah, I think this archetype of like you need the brilliant zany scientist to come up with cool concepts, and then you need like a engineer who's you know worked on a god awful number of uh, you know naval vessels and played around with diesel engines in them and troubleshot and done all kinds of maintenance to kind of fuse together to uh, to deliver here. And that's a metaphor that probably would be useful to. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because yeah, we have the tech geniuses these days that are in that. But then, I mean, Rickover is kind of like that. I mean, he has this like larger than life personality, but he's not about. It wasn't about innovation at all. It was about like deep, extremely good project management, extremely good supply chain management. Yeah. He was kind of obsessed with like the non sexy parts of project delivery, and that's what built nuclear. So he kind of was. He's like the Steve Jobs of <laughs> supply chain development or something like that. Um, Right. It is interesting. Yeah. And his, yeah, he was an electrical engineer and he just had so much knowledge. It was a coincidence of timing. He was just like perfectly baked right when this new technology came online. 
We just came up on an hour. Um, I'm going to float this this one idea quickly, and we'll close on that. And I think we're going to have to have you come back to expound on some of these ideas because it's been totally fascinating. But getting back to this innovation theme, there's this story of this German motorbike. I think it's a 1944 era motorcycle. The Soviets got their hands on the blueprint, said, hey, this is a pretty good motorbike. And until the fall of the Soviet Union, they had a factory or two teed up to produce this motorbike. And it was the same motorbike, same components that were being kicked off the, the uh, production line uh, 50 years later. Um, and, you know, but they, they, they did a lot of units. And so there's this idea, I think, that like command control, I mean, this is the most extreme form of central planning. Obviously, there's, you know, kind of a maybe a social democratic mushy metal in Scandinavia or in France in the 70s. But on the extreme end of, of sort of command control, centrally planned economies, you know, you don't have innovation, but you can bang out lots of units of something. And generally speaking, you don't have the market signals to say, okay, stop that or want to improve it or make it more fuel efficient. And in the West, you know, on the other extreme, uh, I'm not sure like libertarian capitalism or something. I'm not sure if that is the most innovative, but certainly you get a lot of new ideas floating around. And, and uh, certainly if you look at, you know, motorcycles in the U.S., there was a lot of development from the 40s till, uh, till the 90s over a similar time frame. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, you know, if I don't want to say innovation is dangerous for nuclear, but, you know, it seems like the pace of it needs to be slower. If you innovate too quickly, maybe that's just because of the regulatory environment. Um, it slows things down. It slows deployment down. So it, are Russia and China and South Korea and I guess Japan and its heyday in France, are they, were they kind of beating us because they were just able to deploy big, stupid old reactors? Boom, 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 serially. That's not a very inspiring story. Or you think there's some kind of like synthesis between the systems where we can there's, deploy a lot and advance the tech? There's a synthesis. I mean, they didn't just take the exact I mean, the Koreans didn't just take the system 80 plus and just take it verbatim like they improved it and they learned on it a little bit. And they did make a series of generational changes based on on fleet mode operational experience. But the changes were modest and well considered and it ended up being they, they were good ideas. And that's so you don't want to just stop innovation completely. I think if I had to choose, it would I would be like, let's get economical known technology expanding now like let's get back on that curve where we're expanding nuclear at a rate that's compatible with what we want and then given profits from that let's fund as much innovation as we can using the profits of the well operating fleet again that's kind of sort of a dream that's not so easy to just will into existence but uh, uh, that would be that would definitely be ideal. There's plenty of improvements to be made and there have been improvements. I mean the French made improvements to their models as well. But yeah, I mean, if you have a plant that's good enough and it's being and it's running economically and you're selling a commodity, then there isn't that much motivation to jump to changing it. And again, back to Rickover, he would allow design changes and they did iterate on submarines quite a bit for various necessities. But he was very conservative. If you wanted a change, it had to go. I mean, he certainly looked at every single change and there was a huge bias against change. Like if you wanted to change something that had fleet experience behind it, you better have a really good reason to do it. And, it, and you can, but you have to like really back it up. You don't just swap it out because someone published an MCMP calculation saying like, oh, look, we save all, we save the planet. So it's just a big, a big barrier to to get a change is is probably appropriate but um but having a but yeah anyway so yeah go ahead you, you said something interesting which was uh like uh, operationally based innovations and i think that's really interesting because it's like you know yes you've operated a fleet now and then that's informing you that hey this system could be improved versus i think what's going on right now which is a lot of sort of theoretical stuff around like well it'd be great to solve you know the close the fuel cycle so and that's it's not you know, based more in the real world of operation. So so that's, I think, an interesting kind of distinction in, in innovation. Yeah, and it's just, we do have better computers now, but yeah, there's nothing, nothing beats operation. It's just hard to, in, nuclear is intrinsically hard to innovate in a reactor. I mean, we don't, well, we could have more research reactors around or test reactors up and running, but they're expensive. They're hard to operate. They have problems. They're political footballs. Uh, I mean, we had FFTF, the beautiful test reactor, operated great out here in Washington State. Um and people would love to have it right now, but we shut it down in the 90s because there was no mission. It was expensive. There were there were a bunch of opposition who's paying for it and so on. So it's just like maintaining that ability to sort of have a playground to do innovation and, and actually get operational experience. It's just really hard in nuclear. And so that if we could sort of get back to where it's easy to build a, what's called a reactor experiment, which is like a small non-power well may make power but it's not like serving a utility to really like try out 
that's what they used to do. They had an idea, they analyzed it on paper, they built a couple little experiments, and then they built a reactor experiment. And that reactor experiment, we built, I think, 25 of them or something like that. There's a huge number of them, most of which are pretty obscure. But um, that's a step that's like really important. Like, does this system work as a unit in an integrated fashion? And then you go to prototype where you have like every system. And after that, you do demonstration and then you go commercial. But that's a long process. That's like no investor is getting rich off of a 30 year stair step innovation like that, um, which is why most of the developments have sort of been government funded so far. But that that kind of a process, you could maybe maybe dem democratic countries could look at sort of more of an open source type model, not saying everything's publicly available, but we've collaborated as a big group on open source systems like the Linux kernel, for instance, with lots of experts doing lots of complicated technical work in a collaborative way. Fighter jets, <laughs> fighter jets. Are those open yeah. source? <laughs> <laughs> well, not open source, but I'm saying like in international collaboration, yeah, yeah, yeah. like, you know, the F-35, yeah. right? Like if you have something that's big, complex, expensive, and a bunch of allies are going to use together. Yeah. You know, I've, I've always, okay. I've always talked about like, you know, advanced nuclear needs like an eater, needs an eater, right? Like we need to have a, you know, let's have a molten salt, yeah. you know, I mean, well, yeah, and those are, those are probably bad salt, examples because those mega projects have all ballooned out of control as well. Right, but like right, that kind of a, right. some innovation in collaboration techniques would be valuable, for instance, like that would be a good thing for innovation. Um, as opposed to everybody coming up and being like, well, this combination of fuel, coolant, and moderator is my favorite. And so let's just, because that's like not necessarily productive. We need innovation in, in, in project management, collaboration, supply chain, and so on. Anyway. All right, Nick, this has been uh, super fascinating. Um, yeah. Really high yield for me anyway. So thanks for, thanks for making the time to be back. And we'll have you back shortly because I think we were just scratching the... Uh, Scratching the surface there. Um, great shout <laughs> yeah, out to you, my absolutely. friend. And uh, come to COP next time so we can hang out. And All right. Yeah. No, yeah. Thanks so much for having me on. It's a great pleasure. Uh, and take care. All right. Bye for now.